Hi. Oh, I see you recording. That's good. Okay. Um, Chantel, can you hear me? Yes. Oh. Uh, would you do us the honors of praying us in? Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Lord, we come before you to, to this evening, Lord, together as we study the book of Revelations, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you give, you guide, Lord, Juan Maldonado as he teaches us about the book of Revelation, Lord, that you give him wisdom to give us wisdom, Lord, that you open his eyes, open our eyes and our spiritual ears, that you may give us the sermon throughout this time, Lord. I want to thank you for bringing us together throughout this time, Lord that you continue to speak into our hearts, Lord, throughout this time, Lord. And I want to thank you for opening the doors, finally, for opening the doors this Sunday. In Jesus' name, we pray, amen. Amen. Okay, so let's begin. So we're going to pick up where we left off last week. We did the first three churches um, uh, uh, from the seven letters that are written by John to the, to the churches that we covered. Uh, last week, just a little small recap, we did the Church of Ephesus. We did the Church of Smyrna, and then we did the Church of uh, Pergamum, and we discussed what the, the details of the letter. We were able to see uh, the messages that Christ gave to the angel of the church. Remember, those are the pastors of the church to communicate, right, to their members as things that Jesus is seeing. In some instances, we saw that God uh, was approving and commending them for, for the work they were doing, and in other instances, of course, he was saying that he knows some of the other things they were doing that were not pleasing to him. Today, um, we're going to pick up and we're going to go to the Church of Thyatira, okay? And we're going to start discussing that. Uh, one thing we, I want to do before we actually go into, the, into this church is that I, there is a running theme, if you notice from last week's session, that seems to be present in many of these churches. And it seems to be a running theme of false doctrine, pagan worship. Uh, we see evidences of immorality, idolatry. Uh, and one specific, uh, one specific thing that's pointed out, which is eating food sacrificed to idols. Uh, you're going to keep seeing this theme running through the churches because the church, separated from the world, always has to contest with these situations. So this is something that we should always be aware of, that as we read these letters, the members themselves have to have consistently fight against this. We have, they'll uh, continue to be oppressed by the wiles, by the attacks of the enemy who are fought to the children of God and the children of God have to try to sort of have to take a stance to be able to combat this and for God's approval to be over the church. Uh, I wanted you guys to open your Bibles. Uh, there's, a, there's a passage of scripture that I want you guys to read. Uh, if you can open your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm going to try to share my screen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, you go to verse 14. We'll start reading from there. We're not going to read the whole context, but I want you guys to see something Paul addressed to the Corinthian church to continue to understand this flow of consistent issues with false doctrine, pagan worship, uh, you know, the sexual immorality, the, the things that are involved, and specifically when we talk about items that are sacrificed to idols, because all of that is kind of lumped into uh, a, a, a big component of worship that takes place to a false deity. Verse 14 says, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 14, it says, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to sensible people, judge for yourself what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless is not a participation in the blood of Christ. The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, many who are many are really hard, but we all partake of the one bread. Consider that the people of Israel and not those who eat the sacrifices participants in the altar. Why do I imply then that food offered to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No, I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and, and the table of demons. Shall we 
faith provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? This passage of scripture outlines for us uh, and it pinpoints clearly the issue that you find within false pagan worship. And this is why the church needs to be aware and to stay away from these types of practices. So I just wanted to highlight this is so you can see the running theme that is running, that is combating to all these churches. And we'll move on now to the church of Tyathara. Now the church of Tyathara, this is the church um, that is known as the church that tolerates sin. Uh, scholars and theologians label it this way. It's also referred to as the medieval church. Uh, it's, it's one of the churches that uh, covers a cluster of history. Uh, so you, you're going to find this reference if you study and read surrounding the nature of this specific church. What we do know from the seven churches is that it's the smallest one out of the seven that, that uh, John addresses in his writings. Okay. Um, we have no record of anything historical surrounding the, the, the city itself. And what I mean by that is the church history itself. But we do have information about the city being a big city on uh, having a center of business and trade. So what that tells us is that we, just like the church of Ephesus, it had a lot of travelers. So many people were going to and fro this location. Um, Christ starts out addressing this church by telling them, I know your works, like he does in all the other churches, and he commends them for their love, their service, their faith, and their patient, patient endurance. So we look at this, and they seem to be a model church, because these are foundational, essential uh, qualities that, are, that need to be there for a church to be uh, prosperous and successful and to be effective. So we see these four things, love, service, faith, and patience, endurance. Um, we also find that God commends them in the passage saying that their latter works exceed the first, which seems to be another com uh, compliment that Jesus gives this church. And the statement, if you look at the statement, the way it's constructed, uh, it seems to indicate that they were, they had these qualities and there was increasing, increasing in measure, meaning that they were growing in love and service and faith and patience, which is what you want to see the body of Christ do. You always want to see the church grow. Growth is the most essential component that we want to see in the, in the church. Uh, it begins with individuals and it grows throughout, you know, collectively throughout the body of Christ. So this is something that Christ observes about this church and he gives them a thumbs up on this. But he says to them, unfortunately, that I have this against you and you tolerate the woman Jezebel. So despite the commendations that are given here, we find a, a, an interesting title given to a person here. And it seemed like when you look at this church, uh, the problems were not so much external, but they seemed to be internal. There was some level of internal compromise within this church. So we have to pay attention to that because although they seem to be excelling in these four specific characteristic qualities that we just mentioned, uh, it seemed that they were, they, those things were not strong enough. In other words, they didn't put a foundation, a strong enough foundation, where it had a unified sound doctrine within the church, right? So we want to pay close attention to that because though God commends them for this, love, service, faith, and patience, right? These are things that are intangibles. These are things that have to be demonstrated. And they seem to be able to do a good job of that. But sound doctrine requires us to do right, to observe, there's, there's rules, there's, there's certain things that have to be accomplished, right, so that's where I want to draw the, the separation between understanding those intangibles with tangible things, and Christ seems to look at the tangible things, and in this specific case, it seems to be some type of doctrine that's sneaking into the church, and it's creating a situation. Now, this may not have been the literal name of this individual, Jezebel, uh, but she seems to be representing some kind of self-styled uh, prophetess within the church. And she seems to fit a pattern of Jezebel in the Old Testament. Uh, if you go back to 1 Kings uh, chapter 16 through like 21, you'll find the story there where her, uh, uh, she's sanctioning, she's actually sanctioning Baal worship. And Elijah is in the mix and he is the one coming against her. Because this God is bringing him up 
to remind the people of Israel who their God is. And we had the famous incident in 1 Kings 18 with the, uh, with the uh, sacrifice on the altars between the Baals and Elijah. So we have this individual here who seems to be a self-styled prophetess within the church. Now, the name Jezebel itself has a powerful association. For example, um, if, we, if we were to call someone a Judas or a Hitler, right, it means something strong. We're saying a lot about a person. So it was a strong thing to call this woman Jezebel uh, because Jezebel was one of the most evil characters in the Old Testament. And she attempted to combine the worship of Israel with the worship of idol Baal. And that's why we had to uh, pay close attention to that because one thing that we, we, we don't want to do is that we don't want to be able to bring false doctrine and saving doctrine, true doctrine, sound doctrine, and mix them together. Because that's why Elijah got up, because Elijah needed to get up and be able to make sure that there was a, a, a reformation taking place so that, you know, we wouldn't, they, the people of Israel would not continue following Jezebel and her leading them into pagan worship, which led to many of the things that we mentioned uh, before. Now, it doesn't mean that Jezebel uh, was really a prophetess. She only claimed to be one. But it seemed that this church would receive her as a prophet. And this is why Jesus was warning them. And one of the things that uh, most scholars and theologians draw out from this, being that Jezebel is doing this, they believe that she is violating the biblical teaching that women are not to be authoritative doctrinal teachers in the church. According to 1 Timothy chapter 2, and 1 Corinthians chapter 14, uh, we, we, we don't have the platform in this session to discuss those issues, but many scholars and theologians bring that to the table as being a key contributor as to why the objection is being raised. They argue um, that the church compounded an error by permitting her to teach, thereby allowing her to teach error within the church. That's why in the context it says as a result, when you read it, she teaches and leads my servants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. So even though we can't be dogmatic about specifically what she was teaching or who this, indiv who this individual was and what they were promoting, it seems to be an issue that was creating a sense of sexual immorality, that pre-Gnostic uh, um, idea was beginning to sneak into the church. So that became a problem and so it's being addressed here and notice that the text says servants and that shows how terrible the sin was because john is writing but this is jesus words she was corrupting the servants of christ you know and remember the body belongs to christ and he is going to be jealous for his body so it's important for me to highlight that she is within the body of christ right where or unlike uh ephesus when we talk about ephesus they resisted those who called themselves apostles Right? They did the opposite. But for some reason, this church tolerated the teaching and they, and they were seeing its results because this teaching was being taught. And that's why he says in verse 20, if you look at that passage, you tolerate, you put up with this. No one is addressing this. See, where the church of Ephesus was excelling, now the church of Tyathara was failing. And this is corrupting the church. And that's what you don't want to do. You don't want to corrupt the church. And this is why it's important for us to understand what Paul was telling Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, verses 2 to 4, when he told him, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander into myths. We don't want to do that. So th these are the effects Right? This is the effects of what happens when false teachings start permeating inside the church. Another reference I want to point out is in Matthew 18, 6, Jesus said, whoever causes, causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. In relation to, because in the context, Jesus was saying temptation will come. For woe to him through which temptation does come, especially against my children. 
So Jezebel, this, this, this person that just Jezebel is in the church teaching this doctrine is affecting, is decaying, is bringing spiritual death to the church. Now, in Tyathira, the city itself, it was, it says, remember, it was business and trade. They had what was called a strong guild. And all, and, and all that word really means is just a word given to the association of persons in the same trade. So it, 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 they were strong in the guild and, and, and collecting people that were pretty much doing the same field of work. So they stuck together, right? So that would, many theologians and scholars feel that that played a big role into why Christians were being tempted because since everything was business and trade, the believer had to find a way to, and then some social occasion because they needed to do something for, for the personal reasons, for, for home, for whatever, for whatever the reason may be, they needed to be able to mingle and get together, right, and go there. And I believe that uh, what was happening is that when we, they went there, uh, the men and the women, when they were involved in the transactions, the business transactions, there was introduction of immorality and idolatry being offered. And the, and, the, and the people of God uh, were expected to stand in the face of this pressure. But unfortunately, many were not. They were falling into the trap and unfortunately are sinning against the Lord, which is why the church is called a church that tolerated sin. Then God says, Christ says, I gave her time to repent and she didn't repent. Right? So this is his, great, this is his greatest accusation against her because Jesus sees this and they don't want to repent. And it seems that it seems to be that she apparently is rejecting the work of the Holy Spirit in her heart, calling her to repent. So I'm sure that the remnant that were faithful, that were not participating, right, probably even the pastor of the church, was bringing out this problem, but she refused. And what this does is, is sadly, it illustrates to us the truth that people, according to John three nineteen. That people love darkness rather than light. And that is a true statement that the Bible establishes. If God does not save an individual, God doesn't draw an individual in. If God doesn't save an individual, the only alternative that person has is to stay in their darkness. And that's in the situation and the context of John in, in, in that John chapter 3 and those passages is that man is, is blind. Man cannot take himself out of that situation. So... Christ is telling her to repent, and she doesn't want to. Why? Power, prestige, everything that is being that comes with being an individual who's teaching something, and people are coming and flocking, drawing attention. So Jesus says, "I will throw her into a sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her, I will throw into great tribulation." And what this does, it begins to show the evidence that God does chasten people. God does discipline people. Right? God has that right. Right? And in many occasions, we, we discover from Scripture that uh, in many cases, God can kill a person. God, yes, God can kill a believer. If you go to your, if you go to your Scriptures uh, and you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and you start around at the ending of verse 27, you'll find Paul addressing the Corinthian church again, and he says to them, Whoso, whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But, but if we judge ourselves truly, we will not be judged. But we are judged by the Lord. We are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. That passage of scripture again comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We see the evidence that God has the ability to chasten an individual who willfully engages in something that he knows he should not be engaged in. He or she should not be engaged in. So we know from the passage of scripture that God uses chastening because of sin being present. Uh, there's some other interpreters uh, who look at this passage, um, and they use the bed, the, the sample of the sick bed, uh, to look at it as her, her committing sexual immorality. So God was going to give her a bed in hell where she would lay forever. So they look at the imagery of the picture. Uh, 
the reference to adultery is important because it speaks both about uh, sexual adultery and it speaks about spiritual adultery in, in the context of the passage and what the inference in the text seems to lay out for us. So he says to her, I'm going to, do, I'm going to throw her in the sickbed unless she repents of her works. All right, and we mentioned this before, repentance is a change of mind. So God is, expect, is expecting her to change her ways and go the other way. Because what this does is it gives a chance, an example to all the churches, right? That holiness must be present in the church. Because without that, if you remember Ephesians 5, no, no spot or, or wrinkle or any such thing, right? Because the church has to be holy and, and without stain and blemish. So we need to remember the church has to be purified, which is why we have church discipline, which is why we are authorized by God to be able to confront an individual who sins. And again, I want to underline this. She, this individual, Jezebel, is being represented by something within the church. Very, very serious situation. Then he says on the next verse, I will strike her children with death. Right Now we know at the time of this writing, this is a real church, existed maybe 40 years, right? After John uh, started writing, we know around that time frame. And it seems to be that her teaching, that teaching produced generations advocating the same level of debauchery, the same level of immorality, the same level of pagan worship and whatever that was leading to. So you see, uh, false doctrine, what it does is when it's established inside a church, it doesn't stay there, it permeates, and it keeps going because you teach it to others, and you teach it to your children, and you teach it to your family members. So we see that that's what the reference means when I would strike her children with that, meaning those who inherit this, those who learn this, will continue to face God's potential wrath and his discipline because of what's happening. He says this, he says that all the churches will know that I am he that searches mind and heart. And this is another statement of deity from Christ because it expresses his omniscience. He knows all things that are in a person's mind and heart. So if you go to Jeremiah, and this is a borrowed term from Jeremiah 17.10. You go back to Jeremiah 17.10, Yahweh makes that statement. Here Jesus borrows the same statement and applies it to himself, which is great. Another evidence uh, found within scripture that Jesus equates himself in the same nature and essence as God. Then he says, uh, but, but, but for those who have not learned what some call the deep sense of Satan, right? And what this is, is uh, great liberty and license. Because what this teaching seemed to uh, produce was this attitude of liberalism and license. You can pretty much, um, you are free to engage and explore the sphere of Satan right, and participate in evil uh, with the body without harming the spirit, which is that pre-Gnostic teaching. But the term itself, the deep things of Satan, there's no mystery to that. What that term basically means is just getting involved in evil things, right, because that, that, it, it, it's just Satan represents one who just is anti-God. He does everything contrary to God. So anything that's evil, anything that's ungodly, anything that's unrighteous falls into the category of Satan. So that's what the term means. So it's not that there's secret things about Satan that the Bible is trying to ex explore or give us information. On. It's that what happens is sin, when it dominates, when it takes control of a person's life, it really holds a person down in, in such a manner where the strongholds are very strong, right? And the person just continues to fall into deeper sin, into deeper sin, into deeper sin, and they kind of lose that sensitivity to their conscience. They kind of lose that sensitivity to the calling of the Holy Spirit, to God calling out, you know, they're, they're, they're just sliding deeper and deeper, and it's harder for them to get out of that situation. And this false teaching is a great contributor because you're getting information so supposedly from God. It ends up being from Satan, and the individual is now completely entangled and lost and not being able to decipher truth from error. It's a big problem. And then that's what he says to the rest of the church. I do not lay on you any burden. Right? So those who are obedient and, go, and, go, and they won't go to this potential tribulation. And Christ uh, has nothing else against them. So he, he wants that remnant to continue. That's what he says to the one who conquers and keeps my words until the end. To him, I will give authority over the nations. So he wants that remnant or those who repent and change. He makes a promise to them. And what this means is 
um, they will rule with him in his earthly kingdom. They will exercise authority over nations, ruling them with a rod of iron. And these nations seem to exist in the millennial, in the millennial kingdom. And then he finishes it off by saying, I will give him the morning star. So Jesus offered them a reward greater than the kingdom because the morning star in the context is he himself. If you go to Revelation 22, 16, he calls himself uh, the morning star. And if you also go to 2 Peter chapter 2, uh, verse 19, you're also going to find a statement that Peter makes alluding to Christ also being the morning star. So he is the reward being offered to that individual. The, city, the, the church of Sardis. Now this, city, this church is known as the dead church. Uh, also known as the denominational church. Uh, the city itself was known for its luxury. Right? It, had a, it, had a, it, had, it had a reputation uh, for its apathy and immorality. Uh, in there was a large temple to the goddess Sybil. And she was the mother of all gods. Um, the city was also sort of known uh, for its combination of easy money and loose moral environment. So you already get a picture of what that type of living is. You can, you can kind of look at, for example, present day, like the reputation of like Amsterdam in the Netherlands. You know, basically you go there and anything is fair game. You can do anything. It's, so, it's loose, morally speaking. So Jesus says, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. And that's a serious charge. Uh, to this church, Christ bypassed the commendations and went directly to his concerns for it. Though, outward, though, though its outward appearance may have fooled men, it couldn't have fooled the omniscience of Christ who knew their deeds. So he pronounced this church to be dead. And unfortunately, like many churches today that, defy, that, that, that are defiled by the world, spiritually dead, and they're populated by unredeemed people who play church. Uh, this type of spiritual death, unfortunately, is connected to sin. So there is a sin issue that is crazy, causing spiritual decay. Now, the, the, the word itself, dead, uh, indicates to us that as a church, and I'm talking about in, in, in the context of a church, what it signifies to us is there's no struggle, there's no fight, there's no persecution. In other words, the church is physically alive, going through the motions, but they're spiritually dead. So what, that do, what, what a dead church does is that it's no threat to Satan. The dead church doesn't threaten Satan. So it's not really worth attacking, which is why there's no persecution there. So Satan's strategy is, you know what? It'll be easier to infiltrate it since there's no persecution. Because why would, God, why would Satan bother to persecute a dead church? What this does, it shows that uh, the church of Sardis is a perfect model for inoffensive Christianity. There's no preaching of the gospel. There's no reaching lost souls. They're just going through the functions of fulfilling whatever tasks they may have within the church but they're, lost, they're losing sight of the true mission. And that would also involve the love for Christ, which stems from knowing him through his word, and the love for each other, and fellowship, and, and, that, and, that, and, that, and that bond, that unity and the spirit that's needed to sustain and continue moving forward. So Christ says to them, wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. So they're, they're, they're in jeopardy. They're in a serious situation. The things which remain tells us that the spiritual condition of the church was bad, but it wasn't completely hopeless. So it's either that Christ see a remnant in there, or he knows that it's his church, right? And remember what Jesus told the disciples, and specifically speaking to Peter back in Matthew 16, 18, when he says, I told you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus meant that. The church would, would never die. But this church came very close to um, be, being a, a bad example, no longer being a light, no longer being salt because of what was happening in there. But it wasn't completely hopeless. So Christ is saying, wake up, spiritually speaking, wake up. All right? There are things that are spiritual there that I can, re that I can strengthen. Right? I can go back and we can build upon it. So Jesus hadn't given up on the church. I mean, it seemed late, but 
it wasn't too late for them to repent and for turn to turn around and Christ can then uh, reinforce them, allow them to reform themselves, get back up, right? And be able to continue to move forward and to fight, right? Spiritual warfare, because that seemed to be lacking in a dead church, specifically this church. So uh, at the end of the day, uh, we know that it's very comforting to know that and see that Christ is uh, concerned for the believer. This is never too late, but we never want to get to a state where the church is completely dead, where the community doesn't even know it. The people, are, you know, where, where you're established, I don't even know that you're a church and you're preaching your saving gospel and you have information and knowledge about the one true living God. That is, that's something that we, we as a church never, never want to uh, be able to be, uh, have other people say about us. And he says to them, I have found, I have not found your work complete. They were going through the motions, like I mentioned before. Their deeds were insufficient and unacceptable in God's sight. This showed that their works, though present, had not measured up, they ha had not measured up to God's standard. The presence of works, I'm going to repeat this because this is important. The presence of works isn't enough because God requires an intent and a purpose in all our works. Everything we do for Christ as part of the body of Christ has to have an intent and a purpose. We don't just go around doing things aimlessly. That seems to be a problem within this church. We don't want to walk around doing things just to fulfill something. No, we have an intent and a purpose behind it. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. And this is the instructional part. So this is what they have to do, right? And, and, and it, it's amazing to me how the first thing he says to them is to remember, to go back, go back to the beginning, go back and think about where I saved you from. Go back and think about where you come from, where I saved you from. Start there. And how first you received and heard word of God. We always have to remember that. We have to cherish that. And then the whole fast is for them to be able to persevere to the situation. And again, to repent, continue repenting, continue turning, and to restore the gospel, right? Uh, go back to the apostolic doctrine, to the authority that was given to you. Right? Especially my servant John, who's writing you this letter. Go back to that. Listen to him. Right? Go back to the beginning. It's very important. Sometimes we need that as believers to go back and remember where God took us from. Sometimes we forget that. We have not merited anything. We don't deserve anything. We haven't achieved anything. We continue to fight every day a spiritual battle just to make sure that we're pleasing God, that we're living a life that's holy and acceptable to him. And we march forward. He says, if you do not wake up, I'll come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. And uh, this is not a reference to his second coming, all right? But it's, it's, a, it's a sudden, unexpected coming to the unrepentant dead church because he's threatening them with harm, discipline, and possible destruction. All right? That's why he says, because see, uh, the phrase used in the scripture, coming like a thief on the night, coming like a thief, is for those who are unaware. A thief only breaks in when you don't expect him coming. If you expect something coming, then he's no longer classified as a thief. But because spiritual, spiritual bankruptcy and spiritual darkness, when it enters our heart, we kind of close our eyes to spiritual truth, and then things catch us off guard. They catch us by surprise. Then he says at the end, yeah, you have a few names and Sardis. So see, you, you always have a remnant within the church. This is the faithful remnant. Right? And, 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 and Pergamus... And in, and in Tithara, uh, if you remember, there were, there were a few bad among the good. But in this church, there were a few good among the bad. So they're, out, they're, they're being outnumbered if you want to look at it and contrast it that way. So Christ's evaluation of the church at the end is, is comforting to see this. But he wants them to remember that God never forgets at the end, especially to this remnant group. He, he never forgets who's faithful to him. And we should always uh, remember that. Um, one thing I will add, and I want to, I want to, I want to draw this out because when it comes to sin uh, and discipline, uh, and we talked about First Corinthians chapter eleven verse thirty, but I also want to cite for you another verse that's found in Scripture, which is in First John chapter five verse sixteen. John speaks about there is a sin that leads to death, right? 
and such a sin could be pre uh, could be premeditated, unconfessed. That causes that causes the Lord uh, to uh, determine the end to end a believer's life. Now, I'm not saying that it's one particular sin, but whatever that sin is, that is the final that, that is the final one in the tolerance of God. He has the right as as he who has the keys to life and death to take action on that. Okay, and what that means, you know, failure to repent and to forsake sin could lead to physical death. As a, as a corrective judgment by God. So we always have to remember that. You can also look at the story of Acts chapter 5 of uh, Ananias and Sapphira, who lied to Peter about the selling of the property. And when they lied, God struck them dead. And God, again, God has that right. And if you go to 1 John chapter 5, verse 16, and you study his context, you will see that there is a sin that leads to death. Then we say here, people who did not soil their garments. Uh, and what that means, that, that Greek word there, um, soil, soiling their garments, it means a stain to, the, to defile, to smear, or to pollute. Uh, it was, it's a word that would have been very familiar to the church in Sardis uh, because of the city's uh, wool dyeing industry. See, in the scripture, garments symbolize character. So, and if you want passages to kind of look at that, you can look at Isaiah 64, 6. Um, and you can look at Jude, verse 23. The faithful remnant could come into God's presence because they had not defiled or polluted themselves but manifested their godly character. This is why specifically Christ said to this specific group, they will walk with me in white, they will walk with me in white for they are worthy. That's what Jesus meant with that statement there, in contrast to those who soil their garments. And let me tell you, um, that's the great, just one of the greatest rewards that Jesus can give of, of his follower, right? To be able to walk with him. It reminds us back in the uh, Garden of Eden when the, when the Bible, back in Genesis, says that he walked in the cool of the garden when Adam and Eve were present there. And remember that as we're moving throughout the scripture and we're looking to the future, God has promised to restore everything back to where it was in Eden. And then he says to them, to the one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments. And these are the white robes of purity Christ himself wears along with his holy angels. And we're going to see the fulfillment of this in Revelation 19.8, the wearing of the white. It symbolizes that purity. Then he goes on to say that I will never blot his name out of the book of life. Right? And what the book of life is, is it's like a divine journal <laughs> that records the names of all of those whom God has chosen to save and therefore are to possess eternal life. You're going to see mention of this later on in Revelation chapter 20, the great white throne judgment. And you also find this book in the Old Testament. Um, if you guys want some verses, you can go to Psalm 69, verses 27 to 28. The book of life is referenced. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, the book of life is referenced. Luke chapter 10, verse 20, the book of life is implied, if you read the context. And in Philippians chapter 4, verse 3, you're also going to find the book of life mentioned, right? So it's a way if, of God uh, using language to let us know that he is aware of everyone who belongs to him. Uh, and it's interesting that in when we're writing to this church, in, ancient, in the ancient world, when a criminal was convicted of a crime, his name was blotted out out of the city register. So there may have been a usage of, this, uh, of, the, of, this, of these terms when John ran into this church to communicate a message to the church that the names you know, could be blotted out from this book of the living based on the circumstances on there. Now, granted, in the context, he's rewarding Right, the language in the, in, the, in the context here is he's rewarding individuals, but there is an uh, analogy going on here to signify that an, a spiritual death, because when a name is brought out, spiritually speaking, that means eternal damnation in hell. Right? In the city register, it's just that you will no longer be recognized as an individual. Right? You're, it's almost like your history is being erased. He says, and I will confess his name before my father and, my, and before my holy angels. And this reaffirms what Jesus said in the gospel back in Matthew 10, 32, right? So it affirms that all the individuals belong to him. So if, you, if, 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 the, if Christ confesses your name to the Father, that means you belong to him. 
because he is proud of your works of what you're doing. The Church of Philadelphia. Philadelphia um, is known as the faithful church, right? Just like Smyrna, not too much negative things are said about it. It is the, it is the faithful church. Theologians and scholars refer to it as the missionary church. And the reason why it's called a missionary church is because the city seems to be deliberately set up that way because um, in the outskirts of the city seems to be a lot of barbarian tribes, right? Uh, and it seems to function for the Philadelphians to be able to, sp to spread, right, uh, the gospel message. Now, the people themselves, unbelievers, who lived in Philadelphia also took the opportunity because of where they were at, and since they had the barbarian tribe, to spread the usage of the Greek language, the Greek way of life, and Greek civilization in general. The church took the opportunity to kind of use that to spread the gospel. So this is why Christ speaks very highly of this church. Uh, Christ, and we mentioned this before, Christ uses different titles. So in this introduction to this letter, he calls himself holy and true. Whereas the first five churches, we saw that um, the, the scriptures were already um, interpreted for us in chapter one. So now he calls himself holy and true, and this describes his very being. So that's why he uses that. His very nature and essence is that he is holy and true. Remember, we spoke about him being the faithful witness in chapter one, who has the key of David, right? Uh, in scripture, the key represents authority. Whoever holds the key has control. Um, many people may uh, see the uh, a link between an Old Testament reference that you find back in Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22, that talks about the key of David being used, uh, imply where uh, uh, the prophet tells the secretary of the palace that he's going to be replaced by another person and that the key of David will be placed on his shoulder. Right? So it was just a imagery used to show a transfer of power. And we saw that Jesus said it in chapter one that he had the keys to death in Hades. So he continues with the message. But here he calls it the key of David because Jesus alone has a sovereign authority to determine who enters into the Messianic kingdom. And remember that the Messianic kingdom is always tied back to David, right? The promise of the throne. And that's, that's the linkage and why that language is used there. He says, and that key... And he talks about an open door which no one is able to shut, right? And this, what this does is it talks about the evangelistic opportunity that we just described. Jesus said, he told him he had an open door for evangelistic opportunity. And they must go to that door in faith. And, and they were doing that. Go. So that's why he had no concern for their deeds. He also acknowledges in the letter, I know you have little power. Now, that's not a negative statement, right? implying weakness, but it actually implying strength because even though they may be weak in the sense that they were uh you know they 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 probably were not rich right they live in in, in poverty in financially speaking uh, the lord says they were strong they didn't need any they didn't need anything else because in their weakness christ became strong uh they have what the mountain of uh, what the mountains uh sermon on the mount will describe uh Poverty of spirit, right? So we know that Christ rewards them for this, and God becomes the, the, the source of their strength. He says, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Another positive thing. Though the church might have been small in number, right? However, it had a powerful impact in the city, all right? Um, and it seemed that the church had spiritual power flowing from it because there was nothing bad said about this church and it seemed that they were evangelizing. People here, when they evangelized, it seemed that the people were being redeemed. Life was being transformed and the gospel of Jesus Christ was being proclaimed. And the credit to this is based on the truth that they kept his word and did not deny his name. Right? This is, that's, that's key. He says, behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not but lie, behold, I will make them come and worship, worship before your feet. And we discussed this before, what the synagogue of Satan is. Of, of Satan is. Remember, the term is just used to describe that the, that the synagogue is opposed to the mission and the message of the church. And these were those that were slandering and persecuting the Christians. 
And then he says to him, oh, I will come and worship at the feet now. He is not saying that they're going to come and literally come and worship and bow down before them. What this means is that he will vindicate them before his prosecutors. All right? So contextually, contextually in the passage, the idea of vindication is that he would make them right before those who were persecuting them. That's what it means. And that the result of that is that they will then learn that I loved you. But unfortunately, if they don't repent, they will learn that lesson the hard way. Meaning that when they're in hell, they will recognize that they were wrong and what they were and what the, what the church was doing was correct. And, what the, and the way that's going to work out, theologically speaking, is what Philippians 2.10 says, that, that, that part of the verse when it says that, um, so that every name, uh, uh, every, every name, every knee shall bow, out, right, in, in, in heaven and in earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. They bow the knee to know and, re and recognize that they were wrong. He says, because you have kept my word about patience and endurance, I will keep you from an hour of trial that is coming on the whole world. And this verse is very key because this seems to be an event that is still future. Uh, but it's, it shows that it's, it's, uh, it's for a short time, but will severely test the world. Uh, I believe, and many scholars and theologians believe, that this event refers to the time of the tribulation. So what this text does is... Uh, is used as a proof text for pre-tribulation rapture. Uh, when you use, when you find the phrase used throughout the book of Revelation, it's used nine times in the book of Revelation, and it always speaks to those who are not saved. Uh, Revelation 17.8 makes the term synonymous with the lost. So that's, these are uh, true statements from studying the book of Revelation that seem to give credence to the possibility that this test, this verse is uh, indicating a pre-tribulation. In other words, this group of people will not go through a trial that's coming around the whole world. And that's key. And he told them, hold fast, continue doing what you're doing. That no one may take your crown, right? If they, if they fail to hold fast, they crown will be given to another or altogether taken away and the believer suffers loss. And we spoke about that at the judgment of the great, uh, uh, the judgment seat of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 3, 14. So it's an indicator that you can lose crown. It's very serious. To the one who overcomes, I will make him a pillar. And the pillar is, is speaking to the overcomer. And the pillar is going to be in the temple of God. So what it is, it's a picture of strength, stability, uh, permanence, uh, immovability. Uh, you know, it's, it's also... Uh, a picture of beauty, right? So the temple had pillars and it's it 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 beautiful. So Jesus is promising a person that if he overcomes, that he or she will have an eternal place of honor in the temple of God. Right? So that's just reaffirming a state of permanence, which is magnificent. And it says, I will write on him the name of my God. And I will write on him my new name. So the overcomer also receives many names of God. Right? You also have the New Jerusalem, and you also have the new name of Jesus that we, we're going to talk about later on. These names are marks of identification because they show who we belong to. They are marks of intimacy because they show that we are privileged to know him in ways others are not. So it's, it's, it's an amazing reward. And then the Church of Laodicea is the apostate church, the final church. Jesus describes himself as the Amen. Right? And, th and that is the, the, the personification and the affirmation of the truth of God. That's what amen means. Let it be. He also calls himself the faithful and true witness. This is Jesus. And this was a contrast to the lady of scenes who will be shown to neither be faithful nor true. Because remember, this is the apostate church. He also describes himself as the beginning of the creation of God. And I, again, we're going to talk about something that I discussed before when we talked about the word firstborn, the word prototokos in the Greek, right? Preeminence, first in rank. We also have another word specifically dealing with the word beginning that we borrow, that, that is found in John 1.1, 1, 1, right? So if you know in the beginning was the word, the statement we find in John 1.1, 1, 1, we see that it's in the imperfect tense in the Greek. 
And what it does, that, that word, it describes a continuous action to the past with no point, no, not pinpointing any starting point. So what that does, it further reinforces the eternal pre-existence of the word in John 1, which we know the word to be Christ. So beginning of the creation of God is not, be, it's, it's, it's not indicating or, point, or pointing to sequential order, nothing of the sort, not or, or first created being, nothing of the sort. But it's pointing to the fact that he's a ruler, source, or the origin of all creation. Okay? Because it's the beginning, the RK, that's, that's the word. So that he describes himself that way, and it's, it's compatible with John 1.1. 1, 1. He says, now to the church, I know your works, you are neither cold nor hot. So this is interesting, because Christ used metaphorical language drawn from the city water supply. So if you look in, if you if you go back and do some research and do some studying on on, the, on these facts, because they because they traveled several miles through an underground aqueduct before reaching the city, the water arrived foul, dirty, and slightly warm. This put the water in a useless condition. So what it what it's doing here is comparing its spiritual state to the city's foul water. Jesus gave the Lado C in church a powerful and shocking rebuke. You're just like your water supply. Now, what does this mean, right? Um, hot people, right, using the language of the text, hot people are those who are spiritually alive and possess the fervency of a transformed life. Okay, and fervency is an important word. Used throughout the New Testament, the word fervency means to boil. Okay, so that's, John uses the word, to identify how the believer should conduct itself, especially if you go to Romans chapter 12. If you go to that section um, that talks about marks of a true Christian, in that section, you're going to find the usage of that word there. Fervency, meaning to boil. The cold, on the other hand, are best understood as those who reject Jesus Christ. Now, you may be saying, wait a minute, but they're part of the body of Christ. How can they be called? How can they be rejecting Christ? Well, they could be reje they're rejecting Christ in the sense that they are no longer obedient. And if they are beginning to separate themselves from the body of Christ, they're going to find themselves in a situation of compromise. Because what happens is an individual could be within a church for a long period of time and grow cold to the gospel. They're no longer moved by the gospel. And we have passages of scriptures in the book of Hebrews, right? They're called the warning passages of individuals who turn back and go back to certain things. And we can't go into them right now, but we can discuss them at another time. The lukewarm person fits into neither, into neither category. Uh, in the spiritual sense, lukewarmness is a picture of indifference and compromise. That's what it's a picture of. It tries to play the middle. It, it, it's like it's like it's too too hot to be cold and too cold to be hot. It, it's it's almost undiscernible. Um, when you're trying to put both things, they end up being nothing. Except to hear the words that Jesus proclaims. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I was I will spit or I will vomit based on your translation. Vomit you out of my mouth. And this is interesting. Remember, we talked about the double-edged sword being in the mouth of God, right? Remember, we spoke about that. We saw that when, 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 when Christ spoke to John, what he was describing was the penetrating, he felt the penetrating power of the words. Now, the reason why they are in the mouth, why he would spit them out of their mouths, is because the mouth is used to spread the word of God. And because also, not only is the word of God being proclaimed out of his mouth, but he also prays for us. And so we understand that Christ is our intercessor sitting at the right hand of the Father. If you go to Romans chapter 8 or Hebrews chapter 7, you look at those, in, in, those, in, in those chapters, you'll find those statements. I believe it's Romans 8.34 and Hebrews 7.25. You'll find those statements in there. So it's interesting that he said, I'll spit you out of my mouth, which leads us to, see, to say, what is it that they're preaching? What is it they're promoting? He says, I, I wish that you were promoting because what Jesus wanted to change in them was, you know, the deception of playing the middle. He wanted them to move one way to the other. 
because it seemed that they were trying to please the world and to please Jesus at the same time. And that shouldn't happen. And it seemed, that they, and it seemed to be that they were self-deceived. So that compounded their error because they made a statement concerning themselves and Jesus acknowledges that statement. In the disastrous, inaccurate self-assessment that they make about themselves. They say, because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have no need of anything, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable, poor, blind, and naked. So they thought there was one thing, and Christ is saying, no, you're not. You're something completely different. So they lacked a sense of spiritual poverty. They didn't know what it was like to be poor in spirit, right? And I mentioned this before, the, the, the poverty in spirit that the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 3, that Greek word means you cower like a beggar before God. That's, that's what God expects of you because you're, you're, so, you're so reliant on him. You do nothing on your own strength. See, they can look at this church was looking at their spiritual condition and saying they were rich. They say they were wealthy. And they say, I don't need of anything. No Christian would ever should, that's an evidence I ever, no Christian should look at themselves that way, that they're rich, wealthy, and in need of anything. No, we always stay humble, contrite, broken in spirit completely through our lives. And the thing was, the city itself was famous for its wealth. And one thing that's interesting about the city, and I'm going to talk about this right now, is it was famous for a healing that it had. This, it had an ointment, an eye salve. It was famous for manufacturing. And it's, again, the irony that Christ uses here, because they can, re they can produce this this ointment to heal eye, eye situations, but unfortunately they were spiritually blind. And this is where Christ is drawing this contrast with this church. They were famous for the clothing, because right? they were wealthy, they were famous for the clothing they had, but yet Jesus said they were spiritually naked. So you see that this church is an apostate church to the point where they're, they're more concerned with the worldly material things than they are with the things of Christ with the things of the gospel, with the things that the church and its mission is supposed to be concentrated on. So the contrast here that you find is shocking. And Jesus uses historical facts about the city. Then Christ advises them to buy three things from him, which all symbolize true redemption. First, they need to purchase gold refined by fire so that they, so that they then could become rich. And the gold right, that they needed to buy was a gold that was free of impurities, which will represent the priceless riches of true salvation. Then Christ advised them to buy white garments so that they might clothe themselves and put that shame of their nakedness to rest, not to longer be revealed and exposed. Because the white garments in scripture always symbolize righteous deeds and always accompany genuine saving, uh, saving faith. Then he says to them, he offered them eye salve to anoint the eyes so that they may see. And what, this, what it shows is it's like all unregenerate, uh, unregenerate people. Uh, this church needs Christ to open their eyes so they might turn from darkness to light, from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of their sins and inherit an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in him. That's the contrast here. Then he says, to whom I love, I reprove and I discipline. Again, repeating what we said before, right? This indicates that they were believers, right? So this is, again, very important. They were believers, but God had, very, had to use intense words to draw their attention to their practices. And remember, in Hebrews 12, 11, there's a statement that says there, for at the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later... It yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. You study the chapter of Hebrews 12, it talks about how God disciplines us like a father disciplines his children. Then he says to them, be zealous. And that word zealous in the Greek is also connected to the fervency that we discussed in the prior verse. It's connected to the hotness. Right? So he wanted them to be that because uh, the word zeal not only is connected to the hotness, but it's also uh, can be interpreted to be a person who's not, lag who's not lagging in diligence. In other words, it's the opposite of being lazy or being slothful, 
words that you know you'll find in Romans chapter 12. It's the opposite of that. So, in other words, if you're going to repent and, and you repent, show me the actions, show me the works, manifest me the change in your life. I don't want you to be lukewarm. I want you to be hot. Ideally, for those who want to serve him, if you want to be cold, and that's the decision you make, then you remain cold. But remember, there's, there'll be a, ch a, a chastening involved here. Then he, and he ends up at the end. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. So what Jesus does here is he gives the lukewarm church the great invitation. Right? He knocked at the door asking entry to come and dine with them. And the sense of uh, a sharing warm, intimate time with them. Right? That's, that's what it's all about, the fellowship. Remember, he's walking in the lampstands. He's always walking amongst the lampstands. And it's also interesting to observe that in that, if, if, if it's to everyone. So anyone who hears my voice, right? So the promise is made to all. Anyone who hears my voice. So he's talking to the entire congregation. He's also talking to us. So be able to understand anyone who hears his voice. He said, I stand at the door. I stand at the door. So if you compare this to the church of um, Philadelphia, the church of Philadelphia seemed to be the church with the door wide open, which God had the ability to shut and close, right? But it was wide open. And here, this church used to be a church that has excluded Jesus, has assured its doors shut, if you compare the two churches. Then he ends up by saying, I will grant you to sit with me on my throne, right? And those are, and contextually speaking, those who overcome the battle against indifference, compromise, and self-reliance receive the special reward to enjoy the ability to sit on the throne. Just like Jesus was giving that opportunity to sit on his father's throne, he again extends that same opportunity to the believer to also sit on his throne. And with that, we end the session. You can all unmute yourself. Um, Joe, I, can I do that? Let me see. Can I, do that? I, I am muting myself. I don't know if I can do everybody. I'm unmuted. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I can't do it on my end, but if you want to. So I'm happy I made it. 806 is not bad. I, cussed, I cut out a lot of stuff so we can keep it within the hour. That was good. I'm proud of myself. I was disappointed in myself last week. people still muted that's fine well steve was co-hosting right yeah also oh, steve would have to mute yeah steve would probably so have steve to, has uh, to uh, mute i i can unmute individuals i thought everybody just was unmuting as they wanted to oh okay then uh, denise i mean i could ask some okay so we are. Uh, so is there any, any questions, any concerns? This is pretty straightforward. Uh, if you read the context, there's just a few things in the passages that really need to be explained in great detail. But I think if you uh, read it contextually, straightforward, literal, uh, you get kind of an idea of the messages that are being sent to the churches. Uh, I would just reiterate once again, the are running themes that are running throughout the letters, right? You see the patterns that develop in the church. Right? The big ones, the false teaching that always seems to pop up, this ugly head, the sexual immorality, the idolatry that always rears this ugly head within the church, the pagan worship, you know, doing things, you know, being in the world at the same time trying to serve Christ that continues to today. Today, you still have the same situations. Yeah, hey, Joe. Yeah, Juan, the, the explanation of you neither hot or cold, nice school you have, was really good. And, and just, I've, I've always try to uh, define define that that scripture verse hot or cold you know lukewarm I suppose you know when you gave the definition about hot being fervency for the Lord yeah. uh, knowing knowing your works and all that I, I like to use the word I don't know would, would, would it be proper to say uh, fervency being hot meaning being a fruitful Christian yeah, yeah. So it works, is, it works it is, is spiritual. You think of work, you think of spiritual activities. Oh, going on? You can't define a person by their spiritual activities, but by their fruit. Because Correct. that's not life. Right. 
And I think here, um, what you have to observe is that, again, Jesus is observing this directly with these churches. So if he's making a statement that you're lukewarm, right? Not to say that God doesn't know which camp you're in. That's not, what, that's not what's trying to be conveyed here. Now, God knows everybody, right? He searches the minds and the hearts. This is a message directly to the people to respond to the condition in which they're in. So the condition is, hey, listen, if, if you're lukewarm, right, you're not a fervent, which is, means, like I mentioned, this means to boil. The Greek word means to boil, right? And if you're cold, it means that there is no fervency. You're probably slothful, lazy, right? You're not, you're not really giving it all. You're not dedicated to the things you're supposed to be doing, whatever gift, whatever calling, whatever it may be that deals with this, you know, what you were given by God. You know, so again, it's, it, the letters are being written in, in, in such a way where the church needs to respond. Notice the last pattern, the last three churches, the pattern was repent, right? You have, the, you have a repentance message continue being offered throughout the letters. Because again, we're imperfect. We, we know that. We acknowledge that about ourselves. But God always gives us the opportunity to repent, to change. That's what repentance means. Met metanoia, that Greek word, means to have a change of mind, to do an about face, right? But it's, a, it's coupled with confession, right? We're admitting it when you pray to God that you do it wrong. That's confession, right? And then you're required to put it into action. You don't just say it, right? It's like you say, it's like us. And in our, in our normal day living, we say sorry to somebody, but we have to demonstrate that we're sorry to somebody. Sometimes we need to demonstrate that, that you know, if it's an offensive word, if it's something that happens between a husband and wife or brother and sister, right? We demonstrate that. That shows fruits of repentance. So if you want to tie in the fruit aspect, that's fruit of repentance, Matthew 3, 8. That's what John the, the, the Baptist told the, um, the Sadducees and the Pharisees when they came to visit him while he was baptizing in the water. So, you know, the Bible, it's, 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 it's one message. So, yeah. We don't want to be, we definitely don't want to be cold and you, we definitely don't want to be lukewarm. You want to be hot. <laughs> Basically, the message is you want to be hot. You want to be fervent for the Lord. I have one or two more, but I want to give other people a chance. <laughs> um, no, nah, I just pretty much had a comment, I guess. Not so much a question. Um, but I just think like with the... Uh, Laodicea, that's how you say that church, right? Yeah, awesome. yeah it, it's it's like I really found it interesting how I mean, even with the other churches too, but uh, more so with this one, how um, Jesus is kind of like talking to them and making the in, in a way where it's like it relates to them, like on a personal level, like the whole thing with the you know, with the lukewarm and the water, you know, that they, they had their water coming from like five miles away or something like that. I think it said, yeah, mm -hmm. you know. And then the other thing, like they had the, like what you, you mentioned it too, like they had like these natural chemicals to make that eye ointment. And that's why he's telling you, yeah, but I, you know, almost like, it's almost like a little like jab, you know, like, yeah, I guess it is. You know what I mean? <laughs> also, another thing though, I don't think you mentioned it, but um, when, when, when he's saying that you say you're rich uh, and you don't need a thing, um, back in, in, uh, in uh, 80s, I think it was 60, around there, there was like this disastrous earthquake. And and they and they were like the only city that didn't get uh, that didn't accept the disaster uh, relief from Rome, you know. But they did it in like like a cocky way, I guess, you know. And like, yeah, we don't need you. Your, your stuff, so. Yeah. So it shows, you know, um, you don't want to be prideful. <laughs> right. You don't want to be prideful. No, as Christians, we're humble. We're the opposite. We're always humble. That's that's our that's that's our um, our garment. Use the language of the letter. Our garment should be we're dressed in humility. Peter uses that language in First Peter, chapter five. You know, he dress yourself in humility, and at the proper time, you know, God would exalt you. Because all right, we don't we don't we're not exalted. We, 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 who are we? I mean, really? <laughs> no. Yeah, I think it's First Peter five. He, he mentions the term. Anybody else has a question? I, I looked up the reference just to confirm it. Yeah, uh, First Peter five five. 
If you read that verse, it says, likewise, you, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Close yourself, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God oppresses the proud, but gives grace to the humble. That's First Peter 5.5. 5. Juan, those, those scripture verses regarding, which I'm sure you've had many debates or discussion around regarding um, uh, losing your salvation, I'm sure a lot of people use those verses, blotting out your name from the book of life. Yeah. A lot of the Armenians use that. And another scripture verses, uh, when you discuss that topic that's been debated for years, thousands and thousands and thousands of years, can you lose your salvation? So uh, would that be a scripture verse that they use a lot? People who feel that they can lose their salvation, that you can have your name blotted out from the book of life. Yeah, uh, it, it is used and is used with the passages I also gave you, like the Psalms, Psalm 69. David actually praised that. <laughs> so it, it's used as an argument to the possibility that God can blot out your name from the book of life. Um, that was a little harder to answer because. Some people don't believe that there's an actual book of life, right? Some people just think that's just God's way of communicating to us that he keeps a comprehensive record in a, in a manner that's conveyed to us where we understand, you know? Like, in other words, everyone is enlisted somewhere. Um, some people don't think it's a literal book, you know? And if you want to argue that, I mean, you can argue if it's not a literal book or not. I don't think it really matters. I think the, uh, the point is that. I think the point is that God knows exactly who has eternal life. The book of life is just another say you inherit eternal life uh, and that God knows him. His omniscience, he's, you know, God knows who is in the kingdom and who's not in the kingdom. Because there's, really, there's certain conditions when, when you see, when you read these verses, it says he who overcomes. So in other words, if you don't overcome, you know what I'm saying? Hold on, stand. You know, there, there's certain conditions that, that come along with the promise. You yeah, know, absolutely. I agree. I agree. Truth that nobody deceived. You know what I'm saying? There are conditions. I agree. Uh, I definitely yeah. agree with that. Okay. Yeah. I you agree with that because, happens. yeah. I mean, but again, uh, the monkey wrench, the monkey wrench in that is if you're a Calvinist, uh, they will teach you that they have a doctrine called the perseverance of the saints. Right. Where right. I they heard teach that. You, will, you will not fall away because God will preserve you all the way through. Mm. So there is no potential for you to fall away. It's called preservation of the saints. One saved, always saved. Some people know it that way. Yeah. One saved, always saved. Um, so that teaching, well, from their perspective, from their theology, will be brought, will be brought forth, um, and they'll demonstrate that you cannot lose your salvation if you're truly in. So basically what they're saying is if you're truly in, if you've truly been reborn, there is no way you could be unborn. That's really the gist of the argument. So once you're born again, you cannot be unborn. So it's not like God redeems you, right, and changes you. And this, ah, you know what, I made a mistake. He unwashes you, unregenerates you. It sounds funny that way, but that's why the argument exists from the Calvinistic point of view. They don't, look at, they don't look at that. What they will say is that if a person demonstrates this behavior, they were never saved to begin with. That's what I was going to say, yeah. Um, they'll use the argument from 1 John 2.19. They left us because they, never, because they were never of us. So if you guys want that passage, it's in First John chapter two, as used a lot by uh, the Calvinistic camp yeah, to uh, express um, the idea that a person who falls away, apostates, who was never truly converted, who just had you know uh, sensations <laughs> of the gospel, so to speak, you know, they felt good for a while. Jesus kind of talks about that in the parables of the sower. You know, he describes that, right? Tribulation comes, he chokes out the word, all that language. But if you go to 1 John chapter 2, verse 19 says, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have, not, they would, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be complained that they were not of us. So John is kind of demonstrating there that, yeah, they left because they were never truly born. Because persecution probably came, right? The, Lord, the things of the world, right? The desires of the world, the desires of wealth. You know, the parable of the soul where Jesus said that some people fall away because of that. Desires. So it's possible. But this is why it's debated, right? So this is why, they, and this is more on a theological level, right? So on a theologically speaking, when you're interpreting these passages, you put them all together and you look at the counsel of everything and then you come to a decision. 
on where more or less you're going to fall on, on this, this issue in particular, whether uh, the condition really qualifies somebody losing salvation or the condition is really unnecessary. But there are warning passages. So I mentioned them before. We can't go into them, but Hebrews gives us, gives us the, the warning passages that we have to be very careful of. So in your spare time, if you want, you read Hebrews chapter 2. I'll give them to you. You guys can write them down. Hebrews 2, right? In the beginning of the, uh, I'll, I'll give you the exact verses. Hebrews chapter 2, uh, verses 2, uh, verses 1 through One through four, so Hebrews two verses one through four. You go to Hebrews chapter six, verses one through eight, and then of course the famous one, uh, Hebrews chapter ten, which is the willful sin, the, the willful sinner, uh, verses twenty six through thirty one. We have warning passages there that we have to pay. <laughs> the one in Hebrews six is the one that really gets people. Right, so read it, read it on your own, and you know. Yeah, look at it and, you know. Okay, it's Dawn's turn for a question. Okay, Dawn, your turn. I, I, don't, I don't have any questions. <laughs> That's fine. Nobody has a question. I got 12 more if you want. <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> if you, I mean, like I said, I know, I know. Right now. I know, you know I'm pretty retired. I don't work tomorrow, so I'm retired. So I don't. <laughs> and like I said, it's pretty straightforward again. But if there's anything maybe that I said that maybe you have a different opinion on, you translate it differently, you look upon it differently. I you mean, know what's the. You know what's interesting? Referring to Jezebel for a false teaching, you know, false teaching has a way of explaining it's always referred to a she, especially in the Old Testament. All right? Uh, being seduct with a she. It, and this, this, ha this comes from. From the Jezebel, right? The doctor yeah. Jezebel. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he, he, but even the church he, he, did, he says that false. I think it's in Proverbs. Uh, false teaching being seductive. Yes. Uh, uh, the characteristic, the beauty, appealing to the e appealing to the flesh. Mm -hmm. So uh, the Holy Spirit uses that a lot in the Old Testament, especially referring to Jezebel. Yeah, correct, absolutely. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. She's a picture. So what, what the church false teaching? Yes. So what Jesus is doing is painting a picture because. What she did was introduce the Baal worship. We know the famous, the famous account with her and Elijah, Elijah and the uh, yeah. 450, right? So we already know. So uh, she's used, that's why I say I don't think it's a literal person. It could be a literal person within the church. It could be. Uh, she calls herself a prophetess. A prophetess. So she yeah. seems to be prophesying and saying things uh, within the church that's part of the not sound doctrine and is leading many people astray. And if the church themselves don't take on the responsibility of the individuals of reading the scripture and knowing sound doctrine, it's easy to get misled. This is why getting together in the church and listening to preaching and studying the word of God is so important to the believer. You can't live your Christian life listening to Hillsong and Elevation and everything else and doing, you know, that's great. I mean, it's, I mean, it's helpful. Don't get me wrong. But you need to know what the word of God says, you know, to stand, stand strong on the foundation of the word so no one misleads you. Remember uh, Ephesians 4? You don't get tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Yeah. You hear something, oh, that's God. Oh, I hear everything is God. Everything it seems to be right. No, you have to be, have a discernment to know what's biblical doctrine and what's man-made philosophy. One, that, that scripture verse that we covered in chapter 2, uh, verse 22, which says, Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and, and them who commit adultery with her in great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Yeah. Now, could, could the bed the bed refer to false teachers who are who are taught salvation by works? And no, actually, are, it's which was so spiritual it, adultery. Can that, you, can that be seen allegorically? Yeah, it is. It could be seen allegorically. But are you asking me specifically about the bed, the sick bed itself? Uh, it says, "I will cast her into a bed." So I'm wondering, is a is a bed referred to false? Can it be referred to false teachers? No? Uh, it can, yeah. So I, that's why I said in the, I said in the um, in the lecture that it can it can mean both things. It can be both things, okay. Yeah, it can also be it could be physical adultery, just like it could be spiritual adultery. Spiritual adultery. Okay. It could be both. Yeah, it could be both. I thought you were going to ask me. I thought you were going to ask me about the word sick bed itself. 
no. because we have a textual uh, we have a textual issue from the manuscripts surrounding because some translations use bad others use sick bad so there is a what you, what you call textual criticism some yeah. manuscripts don't have sick bad sick some bad? just have bad sick bad yeah let me s-i-c-k yeah sick like a sick bed i'll fall into a sick bed some translations have sick bed and some have bed but that comes down to a manuscript issue so you have to get into textual criticism to kind of decipher from the manuscripts right the eclectic text you know the majority one to see based on the scholar and the theologians how they come to determine which word they use and then why they use it in certain translations versus other translations so that's yeah i don't i mean that's boring stuff nobody likes to do that i do that but We're going to give Stan and Yolanda a chance to ask questions now. <laughs> We're going to ask Yolanda or Rosanna. Yolanda Silva. Unmute yourself. Well, Angel Unmute too. Yourself. What's up, Angel? Unmute them. Okay. And my brother Angel. Ladies, go ahead. I don't have a question. I'm like, uh, I enjoy this I conversation. I really have ah. Okay, that's fine. Don't let, don't let Joe Peer pressure you. No, uh, can you can you guys hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. So I I didn't have so much a question. I think um I think mostly I was interested in the lukewarm uh what you were teaching us with regards to being lukewarm and how um it really is super important for us to be mindful of us not falling into something like that where we just get super comfortable and maybe um you know maybe not see that 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 is something that can happen um you know to us and how important it is to god and to jesus that we don't fall into that state no amen yeah absolutely if this thing, yeah, definitely. You, we, 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 I, that's a, that's a lesson you want to walk away with. <laughs> and then the other thing is, I mean, I have a personal thing where um, false teaching, or or where you could be misled, um, how, how. Um, how really dangerous that could be and how long somebody can be in that state also. Oh, it's, yes. Uh, it, it's something like you said that the only way, yeah, the only way that you're really going to be able to um, to really know and seek and find the truth is by actually developing that closer relationship with God and delving into the Bible and just making sure that what you're being taught is what is being actually, you know, what it really means in the Bible. So that was another thing that I found really helpful in today's, you know, lesson. Yeah, I agree with you. And I thank you, I thank you for sharing that. Because that's, that's, I mean, at the end of the day, I think that's one of the most important things we can walk away from tonight, right? We got to be able to read our Bibles. I mean, this is why me personally, this is just me personally, that's why I don't like the new wave of technology, so to speak. I grew up, you know, and I grew up and I was brought up by my parents where they always believe that you always read the physical Bible. Uh, and the reason I say this is, and again, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with technology, please. Nothing wrong with technology. But I feel that technology makes us lazy. Because not everyone is up to the task of always reading and studying, because I know you have lives, so you get busy, and the things that need to be done. But I think that this 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 technology aspect sort of contributes it contributes to it, and it makes it easy for you to dismiss. You know, even on Sunday, like if you were to go to church on Sunday, you can probably count how many people would actually bring a Bible with them. Right? You would you probably use their phone. I mean, and again, there's nothing wrong with that. I think it's it you know. At least they can read it. And I know the church itself puts up the passages up on the screen, which is helpful. But again, you need to study. There's a difference between reading the Bible and studying the Bible. And so you gotta get more, you gotta get more familiar with what it teaches theologically, right? You gotta look at you know the continuity that you find from the beginning all the way through. 
right? Of course, you separate the Old Testament from the New Testament, but you've got to understand the continuity. It's doctrines. It's called doctrines. And the reason I say that is because based on your statement you just made, unfortunately, you come across many people that don't do it. And because they don't do it, anything that's said from the pulpit is amen. It's yes. It's like, yeah, the pastor said it, so it must be true. <laughs> Granted, again, we have a great pastor, and I know, you know, he's not going to go out of his way to teach us something false, but if something is said at a time where, you know, neglectfully or, you know, not on purpose, but something is said that's completely off base, you need to be able to catch it and not, you know, hold on to it and say, oh, yeah, 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 this is true. No, we need to know what the Bible says and be able to prepare ourselves. That's why you can listen and, and I, I get criticized a lot because I do come hard, I do come down hard on certain churches and what they teach because what they teach is heretical. You know, you cannot listen to Bethel Church. Bethel Church is not even a church to begin with. Bethel Church is a cult. That's not even a church. You know, Elevation, Stephen Furtick, I wouldn't recommend him to anybody. You know, these are things that we have to be mindful of. And unfortunately, I, I'm surrounded by coworkers who listen to this stuff. And they think this is good doctrinal exegesis. I'm like, no, no. This is how you fall into the trap of what they're trying to teach you. Because a lot of times you don't know what the Bible says. It sounds good. Remember I read the passage from uh, 2 Timothy 4? They will accumulate teachers to tickle your ears. They're going to tell you what you want to hear. They're going to try to encourage you. That's what Joel Osteen does. He even admits, I don't preach on sin. I'm only going to tell you you're the champion. Right, that God has all this purpose for your life, and it's uh, and it's one sided. It is so one sided that you don't understand what's expected of you as a believer. He will never talk about denying yourself and carrying your cross. He will never talk about you know uh, the persecution, the mockery, the things that you will go to just for being a follower of Christ, but just identifying yourself with Christ. So these are the things that we as believers have to understand that they exist. And when the person tells me that, you know, they love Bill Johnson, I get scared. My heart drops out of me because I'm like, do you know what this man teaches? I'm like, what? Like, I know either that person doesn't read the Bible or he has no he or she has no idea what they're talking about. Because there's no way you can listen to those sermons and say that's biblical doctrine. No, no way. No way. Same thing with Hillsong. Uh, what's his name? Uh, Brian Houston. Talk about that his name is. The lead pastor. Carl Wentz with the Hillsong here in New York City. His affiliation with Oprah oh, Winfrey. Oh. <laughs> yeah, but it is a new age, you know, psychic type of, you know, religion that's just real, really, really far-fetched. Guys like Rob Bell, who now teaches universalism. Hell doesn't exist. All of a sudden now, hell doesn't exist. It's like it's omitted from his Bible. Again, because the Bible warns us that four teachers will come, they will, and, and the people will gravitate to that message because it's what they want to hear. That's why I respect men and women of God who will preach the word from what it is. Because it's not their words, it's God's words. I think we lose touch with that. We think, oh, it's, it's this individual preaching that because he's biased about something, he's angry about something. No, it's because the word of God establishes that truth. And God is warning us about these things. And sometimes, hey, listen, even me, I, I'm, not, I'm not perfect. I have to be reminded of things. But when you grow in maturity, right? When you grow, you become more sensitive to false teaching. The more you know the scripture, right? Your antennas are always up, always. Your antennas are always fine and you're always paying attention to what people are teaching. Because then you know what the Bible says and you're like, wait a minute, but he twisted this. Wait, but this, this is not from the scripture. Why would you do this? You know, why is he teaching this? You know, and the Holy Spirit is there. You know, sometimes he, he moves us to pay attention to these things. It's uh, so, Alanda, Alanda, thank you for that so much. That's very important. It, it's it's very you know I, I stand a hundred percent what you just finished saying, reinforcing what you said, Juan. <clears throat> you know when you look at the Old Testament, look at the Bible throughout the, Israel, the 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 false teachers always drew the biggest crowds, always drew big crowd. And meanwhile, God would raise a voice like a Jeremiah or Isaiah or Ezekiel, and they would say shut this guy up already, you know, because they wouldn't heed to the truth, you know, but before we can know false, we have to know what's truth. You know, we have to really know what truth is and, mm -hmm. and have, and have a hunger for truth. We have a hunger for truth, not for the personality, 
how he preaches or she preaches, but really put that aside and say, is this person teaching scripture or is it I'm just attracted to his character and the flamboyant words and, you know, uh, God give us that discernment to be able to identify truth and false because Jesus warned us in the Bible. He said it clearly, take heed that no one deceive you. Deception is, ramp is running rampant rapid within our circles you know and then when you when you point out these individuals like brother Juan has forget it he's not going to make many friends he's not going to he's going to have he's going to have enemies you know he's how dare you talk to him about that you're judging him listen well, I, I, I'm, ju I'm judging doctrine i'm not judging listen, salvation i'm judging doctrine I, I listen i had to i had to defend myself with my entire the team that I work in, or almost the entire team, I had to defend myself on Joan Osteen, my own boss, my own boss. Yeah. She is, according to her, her faith is Catholicism. She's Catholic, right, by lineage. It's a pedigree thing, right? So she grew up in the Catholic Church, and she identifies with the Catholic Church, but she says she listens to Joan Osteen. And I know that Joan Osteen is on TV, so I know, you know he, he's able to communicate to many people. I had to defend myself because... She, so she knows, she knows that I'm a, of course she knows I'm a Christian and she knows that I teach and blah, blah, blah. And one day she walked into the office and she, she handed me one of Joe Osteen's book. She said, look what the book and I'm reading. And my response was, and I'm no lie. I, I'm telling you, my response and, and the Holy Spirit's my witness is, he's a heretic. <laughs> that was my, that's the first words that came out of my mouth. I said, he's a heretic. And she says, she goes, really? I knew by her response that she had no idea what I was saying and why I was saying it. Because my boss seems to be a person who is trying to, she's searching, right? You know how people, you find, come across people that are just, they just want to know, you know, they, they, they need some direction. They just need somebody to kind of like guide them along the way. Um, but she got a little defensive because she said, but I love, I love what he says. Those are the words she uses. I love the way he speaks and I, I love the encouraging. And you know what? She went as so far as to, in her office, she took a piece of paper with a piece of tape and put it on her front of her desk, and she said, and she put on there, expect a miracle today. So I asked, I asked her, why did you put that in? And she said, because I read it in the book. In the book. Which book? The, <laughs> um, uh, the Power of I Am. Yeah. So I, you know, and so again, and we had a, we had a dialogue. We had, a, we had, we had a, about a five to ten minutes, you know, she's my boss, so I got to, you know, I got to lean back a little bit. I can't go too hard on her. So, because I, I want to do it in a respectful way. Uh, but she was a little, I can tell she was a little uh, affected. I'm going to use that word. She was a little affected by why I had to respond to her surrounding what he teaches. Because I say, even in Catholicism, right? Even in Catholicism, they wouldn't even tolerate some of the stuff that's being taught by John Osteen. So she admitted, but again, she's not saved. She's not somebody who's pursuing the biblical Christ. Right? She's, she's looking for religion. And that's where I, I'm trying to explain to her there's a big difference when you're pursuing religion as opposed to seeking a personal relationship with the living God. And I, and, and I know that's foreign, right? Those, those, are, those are statements that according to 1 Corinthians 2 are spiritually discerned to her. She doesn't understand that, right? Those are spiritual things that are hidden from her eyes at this stage in her life. But I'm trying, you know, you pray and you try. You pray and you keep trying. And I do that with my coworkers. And, you know, sometimes they receive it. Other times, based on the harshness of the statement, they, you know, they, they, they take two or three steps back and they ignore me for a while or they avoid me for a while because they don't want to get into a conversation with me surrounding that issue. I had one of my coworkers, and I knew she was trying to set me up. She was asking me um, why, why it was wrong for two people who love each other who are not married to live together. She, and she asked me this question in front of everybody. I was like, why, 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 why does, why do you do this? Because she knew that I was going to respond to her the biblical way, right? So I responded to her question, right? And I saw by her demeanor that she wanted me to say that in front of everybody so that everybody knew what I felt surrounding that topic. As opposed to asking me the question because she wanted to be uh, biblical, biblical, you know, literate, biblically literate about what the Bible actually says. Her goal was to have everybody hear what I had to say on the subject. See, but one thing I always do 
when I explain something from the Bible, it's, I, I'll, I'll make sure that, I, can, that I clarify with them, it's not me. This is not my opinion. This is what the word of God says. You see, and that's sometimes that, author that, that authority, that authoritative stand that you take with the word of God removes you from being the one, you know, as, as, as conveying opinion or thought or, or, or whatever else people may come up with. No, the authority is the scripture. I submit to the scripture just as much as you have to submit to the scripture, right? And when you present it that way, right, you put, you put yourself on equal, uh, equal footing with somebody, it changes the conversation. Because if they thought they had something on you or they wanted to be above you, right? Now that, that entire dynamic has changed. So, you know, but these, that's, that's the price of being a Christian. Remember I told you guys last week, that's part of the fringe benefits. You're a follower of Christ, expect that to happen to you. You know, you're, you're going to be treated a certain way just because you're a follower of Christ. I see evidence in my life, but I don't, I don't let that get to me. And with none of us, I, I encourage everybody, don't let that get to you. Remember, at the end of the day, you're, you are accountable to God. You have to be the one that has to give account for your life to God. That person is not going to vouch for you, and you cannot vouch for that person. And if you believe the Bible to be true and authoritative, inspired by God, then we have to believe everything that it says and try to live it to the best of our ability through the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And don't deny him. Remember the church, you obey my word, you don't deny my name. That's big words. For God to say to an individual, you don't deny my name. He says, now I'll confess your name. You know what's that? To, for Christ to confess our name to the Father? That's to say, that's to say dawn. That's like Christ says, dawn. She's one of us. She's united with me. I mean, that's, the words are not, are not enough to really understand that this is the God, this is the God of the universe. This is the almighty God who knows dawn how. That's amazing. With all the people in the world. Yolanda, go. Yolanda. Yeah, well, that's what Second Timothy says, that the, the Word of God is for reproving, for teaching, and for setting things straight, right? That's so, right. You know, when, when you're being challenged, when you're being challenged like that, that's what you do. You go straight into the Scriptures so that you say, well, this isn't me saying this. This isn't what I think. This is what, this is what it says here in the Bible. This is what God says. And then you'll always, I mean, there's no, there's no better backup than that. And then they take, they take it from there, and then if the seed is planted, it goes forward, right? Amen. Yeah, that's it. And I, so I encourage everybody, be bold. You know, be bold. Be like Paul, man. I love Paul. You know why I love Paul? Because Paul knew that every city he go to, he, he wouldn't say, take me to the nearest synagogue. He said, show me where the next prison is I'm going to be at. <laughs> it was a walking riot. Everywhere he went, there was Paul a riot. Said, okay, what prison are you going to put me in now? <laughs> yeah, he wasn't welcome. And he wasn't even doing anything wrong. He was just preaching Christ crucified. That's it. That's all he was doing. Preaching Christ crucified, resurrected from the dead. The true and living God. That was it. That's what he was preaching. Because of that, they would persecute him. I was listening to Paul Washer today. I said, my God, if we, it, this is a preacher that wouldn't. Paul Washer, which you know. Uh, yeah, I know him. He, he would not be popular in the, in the circles no. today. <laughs> no. He, oh he, yeah, no, he rubs he rubs people the wrong way because he's very straightforward. He very he's known as the one time invited preacher. You know that, right? He gets invited one time and that's it. They don't want him no more. They invite him one time and they don't invite him again because his messages are stern and hard, but they're very biblical. Very and, biblical with grace, yeah. Well, yeah. He does it with grace, but you know, with grace, if, yeah. if you're not ready, if you're not ready, you're like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, you know, you get convicted, you don't want to hear this guy no more. Yeah, you know. So I appreciate that, Yolanda, tremendously. Okay, we're waiting for Roseanne now. <laughs> no questions? No, no we have no questions. No questions. No problem. Angel, any questions? No? No questions, then we, uh, we, we, no, we finish. Questions. All right. Listening. Okay. Thanks, Juan. Isaac, any questions? No? You good? Any comments? The only thing I would say is uh, now I feel better because, like, I don't even watch Christian TV anymore because it just turns much. me off. You're not missing much. Hey, you're not missing anything. Trust me. TBN, you're referring to TBN? Oh, you're not missing God. anything. You're better off watching, you know, some other good sound I'll, doctrine I'll on YouTube. Yeah. yeah, on YouTube or, YouTube. you know, yeah. guys that you know are firm in the doctrine. You know, I always tell people, listen, I, I acknowledge that most people that are firm and good teachers in the doctrine are a little bit more boring in the sense that some people like the more enigmatic, you know, dramas, yellers, 
you know, they have big personalities like Brother Joe, but they really don't say much. They, they give you one-liners, you know, they're, they're trying to throw things at you, but they don't really teach, teach. They don't, they, don't, they don't exegete the passages. They don't take the time to really explain to you what the Bible says. And those are the teachers that we should be pursuing. Those are the ones you want to listen to, the ones that actually take the text, read the text, and explain the text. Not those that get excited, run around. I grew up in that environment, all right? And I'm not, I, and I'm admitting it. I grew up in the environment where the preacher was invited to the church, and to us, a great, a great preacher was one who ran around the church and yelled and did all kind of stuff. And you would think you walk out of that church edified, but he really didn't teach me anything, right? I was just hyped up with everybody else because yeah. he was hyped up. Um, you know, and again, I'm not saying they're not saved. I'm not saying they're not, they're, they're not you know, people who, who serve and love the Lord, but I want to learn. Right? I want to be edified. I want to be able to walk out and say, you know what? I'm going to go look at that biblical passage. I'm going to look at that biblical passage. I want to learn. I want to see what the text says. You know, give me some, some meat that I can walk away with and build upon it, you know, and grow. That's, that's, what, we sh- that, that's what we should all desire, you know, and not stay in that milk. You know, I don't, I don't want to stay in that spiritual milk anymore especially when you serve Christ so many years. And that's, you know, this is the reason why a lot of people are scared to evangelize, why people get scared to, to stand up and speak, because they know they're weak in the faith. They know they, don't, they can't defend the faith. They know they can't be able to cite anything in the Bible, and they'll be embarrassed in front of people. Because I, I've seen it. I witnessed this by myself. My wife and I used to be in charge of the evangelistic team in the church that we came from, and we used to try to do programs, but we used to teach people. You know, how to speak to people. We did the best we could. I even brought, I invited one of my brothers with his wife who put this whole program together. And we tried, but we saw that they struggled. Why? Because there was a lack of dedication to know what the Bible says and being familiar with what the Bible says. So when they talk to people and they throw out verses, a lot of times it was out of context. It was just all over the place. And the person listening was not really gauging or understanding what was being relayed to that person. So I think, you know, this is another factor as to why it's important for us to know what the Bible says, because you won't evangelize. I, I can always bet it. <laughs> I can always bet it. you won't, because you're going to feel a certain way. You're going to feel like, ah, and you won't be able to, uh, to take it after a while. You'll, you'll cower away from wanting to talk to people about Christ and explaining what the gospel means. And that doesn't mean you have to win the argument. That's why I told you, you're not winning because you're not arguing anything. You're not trying to say, well, I'm smarter than you. Oh, no, no, that's not the issue here. It's just to proclaim Christ. That is your job. It's to, and start the conversation. Start the conversation. And you, you'd be surprised, man. I'm telling you. I don't know. I think I mentioned this before to, to, to Joe. I used to teach Sunday school in my job. God gave me that privilege. I had 11 people in my class. In my job, we used to go into the conference room for one hour. And I used to teach for 11 people. And one of those people, out of the 11, one person gave their life to Christ. And she's still serving the Lord today. Wow. She even promised me. She even said to me, she pulled me to the side because I'm not, I'm not a pastor, so I can't marry nobody. But, but I work with somebody who is a pastor. <laughs> so she, said, she told me that she, um, she, she was attending the class. And she was very shy. Never said a word in the class. Very shy. She came. She listened attentively. I could see it in her eyes. She was listening. And she seemed to be reading. She told me after, every, after, her, after her conversion, she told me, you know what I did? She said, I went to a church in my neighborhood, right? I went there, and I, uh, as I was there, I was listening to the message, and the, and the individual gave an invitation, you know, to come up to the altar. She said she went up to the altar, they prayed for her, and she said that she's never been the same again. Mm-hmm. And then she came back to me. She confessed to me that she was living with her boyfriend in fornication, and she knows she was dead wrong. So she even moved out of her house until, until he, she made him marry her. I was like, what? I was like, well, that's on you. I didn't tell you to do all that. But she said, <laughs> she said, yeah, she went, she got married and she spoke to Louis. Louis you know, I don't know if you know, I'm familiar with a church here on, um, it's called El Shaddai. It's, it's, it's a Spanish church on, um, oh, what's the name of that street? It's on the Home Avenue area. If you're familiar with the area Jennings in that area of the Bronx. It's somewhere in there. I can't remember the name of that street. But he's a pastor there, El Shaddai Church. And I spoke to Louie and I told him what happened. And she told me if, Lou, if, if, if he marries me, I'm going to make sure that Louie is the one that, if, if, my, if my boyfriend marries me, I'll make sure that Louie marries me. And she did it. She kept her word. She got married and everything. Her life has never been the same. And I said to her, welcome to the family. I said, welcome to, welcome to the family. 
But see, this is what I'm talking about. Again, you can't be scared to preach the word or to share the word with people. You can't. You just can't. You know, and live and live a good, you know, and live your life the way you're supposed to live your life. You're not. You're not perfect. I, I understand that. But I'm saying you, your character, the way you conduct yourself, the way you speak, people are going to notice those things. And when you have conversations, you're just going to keep building, keep building, keep building, and you're going to be surprised what people will say to you. Listen, the other ten, they I still see them, and they respect me. They'll tell me once in a while to pray for them on something, you know, to keep something in prayer. They'll, t- they'll tell me small things like that. Um, but they haven't made, they, you know, they haven't made that confession of faith. They haven't taken that step to say, you know, I'm a follower of Christ. I believe in who he is. None of them have done that. You know, oh, you know what I did too? I went out of my way and I bought each, each, each and every one of them, I bought them a Bible. Yeah. To, show, to show my commitment to them. I said, listen, if you guys come to the, and, oh, let me tell you how this all got started. So this is, there was another believer in the office, right? Another believer in the office. And every day, at, uh, well, no, no, let me just say every day on Fridays, she was the secretary of my boss. She was like the administrative assistant to my boss. So she, I, I used to say to her, I, uh, have a good night. And if I don't see you, I'll see you at the wedding. I used to always tell her that, I'll see you at the wedding. Because I was trying to infer to her, you know, if the rapture of the church was to happen, I'll see you at the wedding feast. And I used to say that in front of everybody. So one day, finally, this young lady, she approached me and she said, what do you mean by the statement that you always, you know, you're always throwing out the statement out there? And I don't really know what that means. Only Jasmine seems to understand what you mean by that. That opened the door. When she started asking me that question, I explained to her about what the Bible says in relation to, you know, what we know as eschatology and who we are in Christ and believers. I, I kind of gave her a high overview of what the Bible teaches. And she was very interested and I think she spread the word around. So I said to her, okay, you know what? Since you're asking me all these questions and I really, you know, we're at work and we technically can't be doing this like this and, uh, uh, all the time. Let's get together and let's have a, a class in the conference room. And that's how we got started. I started with three and then little by little, people started getting added and I got to 11. And I was so grateful to God for that. I was so grateful to God for that. A lot of them were Catholic, you know, a lot of Catholic background. So we were able to kind of talk a little bit about Catholicism, you know, look at the catechism, what they taught in the catechism and what biblical Christianity was teaching. They seemed to have a, a good, uh, some, some idea of the Reformation, you know, Luther, what, what that all was about and why the difference in the, in, in, the, in the separation and all that. So I was able to use that to my advantage to explain that and go into the scriptures. And, you know, I, hey, one. That's how it works, right? And so when Jesus healed the 10 lepers, right? Only one came back. <laughs> it's just one of those things, you know? God saves whoever he wants to save. And my job is just to preach the gospel message and try. But you could have been just the person doing the watering. Someone else could be yeah. planting or whatever. You, you don't know. That's something that only really God knows, you know? Exactly, right. I don't think maybe one person that's left on here now, maybe he's like, okay, I heard the gospel the first time I accepted it. Um, I could say that was not me, <laughs> for sure. So uh, sometimes, you know, you got to uh, get through the hard head a couple of times mm-hmm. or five times or a hundred times. True point, true point. Excellent point. That's why I don't give up, you see? That's why exactly why I don't give up because I know that. I know I don't save people to the Holy Spirit, so I can't give up. I don't know when that moment's going to be. Right? And I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I do a favor by saying, oh, you know what, I'm tired. I've already spoken to this person about Christ 10 times. That's enough. I can't take that approach. I will not allow myself to take that approach. I got to continue to demonstrate my, my, my behavior and also speak to them. Find ways to open the conversation about Christ and who they are. You know, talk about, you know, what, what, what common ground can I, can I, can I pick up on? And I can get them to kind of talk Hey brother. Yeah, Angel. Brother Juan, uh, when you when you spoke about correcting, was that uh, one or two? About. Uh, uh, it was. Um, After ten. No, no. Um, uh, the, 11, the things that the things that I, chapter eleven, verse twenty-seven. Oh, about about the um, taking their lives because of the uh, taking the um, the Lord's supper. Yeah. Yeah. First Corinthians eleven, verses twenty-seven to thirty. 
Corinthians First 1. Corinthians 11. Yeah, 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 27 to 30. That's what I cited. I talk, I talk about discipline. Is that on, on uh, yeah. whoever therefore eats the bread of, and drinks the yes. cup? Can you clarify, can you clarify the, uh, the part of the way it says, unworthy man will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord? Yeah, an unworthy man describes an individual who, take, who partakes of the Lord's Supper without repentance and confession of sin. So if you're drinking an unworthy man and knowing the sin in your life, remember the, mo the moment you take the cup and you drink the blood, you're recognizing, right? You're, you're fulfilling the actual analogy of John chapter 6 when Jesus said, whoever drinks of my blood and eats of my flesh, right? whoever doesn't do that does not partake of me. So when you, when you are at the Lord's table, you're actually participating of that of that act. You're doing it in remembrance of him. So an unworthy manner is to be doing that knowing that you're living a life of sin, knowing that you're unrepentant and unconfessing it. That's why I coupled it with 1 John 5 that talked about a sin that leads to death. Because in the, in the, in the uh, context, Paul says that's why some of you are sick. So he gives a reason to why they're sick because you're drinking in an unworthy manner. Your union with Christ is not something to be played around with. Like, you know, we can't, we can't take sin like it's nothing. It's like, like it's arbitrary. No, sin to God is very seriously. And if you're practicing sin and you're a believer, right, you're really putting yourself in a situation where God can bring judgment over your life. He can. He can do that. Amen. Amen. Thanks for clarifying. So that's why the Bible warns us. The Bible warns us about those things. We don't have liberty to do whatever we want. <laughs> we have freedom in Christ, but that's freedom from sin, from the power of sin. Not freedom to do whatever we want now because now we're not under law and, you know, everything is gravy so to speak, you know, use that language. No, no, no. We, we still submit to the laws in the sense that we have conduct. And that's what the New Testament is written, to warn us and remind us about idolatry, you know, and slander and talking gossip and all the language that you find, like, for example, the, uh, the works of the flesh in Galatians chapter 5 that you want to stay away from. We don't participate in that. But we can slip into it. But again, our job is to confess and repent, all right, and, and to walk away from that. So you don't want to drink it on a worthy manner. You don't want to do that. That's what the passage warns us about. That's why I read it to you. Thank you, brother. Good question. That's a good question. Yeah. Thanks for clarifying that with me. Good. That's it. We done? We got four minutes and we out of here. Four minutes. Four minutes and we are officially closed. And... Um, we're gonna have brother Joe play this out. We got four minutes left of questions. <laughs> yeah, four minutes left of questions. That's it. Yolanda, you got a question? I didn't hear what she said. She said something. Oh, but I was just saying that I just wanted to make this comment about you were saying about like, oh, can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> I was just wanting to make a comment about you uh, uh, when you when you talk to people about the, um, not giving up and just continually saying something because if you if you're preaching to someone and they don't get the sense of it that time. You know, you want to continue to keep talking to them because you may say something in a different way where they'll be able to get the sense of it and then it hits them. And then it, it reaches their heart. That's right. That's why I, I can't give up. And none of us in this room, none of us in this room should ever give up. That was, that was all I wanted to say. <laughs> no, thank you. No, thank yeah. you. You, you, bring up, you bring up good points. You bring up excellent points because we all live this reality. You see, this is not just for Yolanda. This is not just for Juan. This is for everybody in this room. We all have family. We all have coworkers. We all have people surrounding us that we need to spread the gospel to and find ways to continue, continue, continue. And don't get discouraged by them seeing them, you know, like sometimes you see people take three steps forward and they take nine back. And that discourages us because we're like, he's a heathen. Forget about him. Because that's just natural response. But we shouldn't give up on them. We should try. Listen, my dad, my father, was the first one to get converted in his family. My grandmother got saved, my uncle got saved, my aunt, everyone in the family got saved. Why? Because my father continued. My father wasn't giving up. He would continue, continue, continue. It took time, don't get me wrong. This is, like you said, it didn't happen like overnight. 
my father got saved yeah. back in what was he said 1974 the first family member that started coming to Christ was somewhere in the 90s we never gave up we never gave up he continued we live a life that's right before the Lord as the Lord they saw other people saw the conduct and then gradually the Holy Spirit started walk, work, working in their hearts give up Man. You never know, man. You never know. And like Dawn said, you plant, you plant, and somebody else comes and you know gives it his growth. You know, you know, it happens too. Sometimes they need to hear from another person too. They're like, wait a minute, there's two of you guys. <laughs> oh, there's three of you guys. Wait a minute. What am I missing out on? You know, and again, you know, the mind starts working. You start thinking and take a closer look. They take a closer look at what's going on here. Yeah, definitely. You got to test the waters. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're going to fail sometimes. I fail. Listen, I fail in the sense that I, when I say, when I say fail, it's, I feel like I fail. But I, I, I can't let the emotions govern me. I can't let the emotions govern me. That could just be me at that moment feeling like I'm failing because I'm not getting through to the person. Right? I can go back frustrated and pray for that person in a frustrating mode. Like, Lord, why can they not see it? What, is, what, I, what am I missing? Right? You, we, I'm human, right? Like everybody else. And we go through that. But I, I, you know, in, in, in your maturity, you try to just look past that. And we also have to remember, too, it's also a spiritual battle as well. Because mm -hmm. we want to get them saved and get them into God's kingdom. But we know there's an enemy that wants to keep them out. Exactly. So there's always that struggle. Excellent point. Yeah, absolutely. Spiritual warfare. It's a reality for us, just like it's a reality for them. <laughs> Thank you, Dawn, for that. Thank you. All right, so it's 9 o'clock. I'm going to ask Brother Joel to pray us out. And I will see you guys, God willing, next Thursday. We'll start talking about the throne room, Revelation chapter 4 and 5. Lord, we thank you, Father, for this wonderful evening and just being able to engage around your word, of Lord. We thank you for our instructor, Brother Juan, and we just ask, Lord, that you continue to strengthen him, anoint him, Lord, fill him with your spirit and your knowledge, Lord, that, that you can continue stirring the gift that he has of teaching, Lord, that we can just gravitate to the word of God, Lord. We need to learn the word, Father. Help us to be the Bereans that you have called Amen. us to be, oh God. Bless each and every person, every man, every woman, Lord, and that we continue stirring a hunger in our hearts, Lord, for the word, Father. And we can be able to discern between truth and false, Lord, regardless of the person, regardless of the personality. But, Lord, that the Holy Spirit will be our teacher when we open up that book. Direct our lives each and every day and be in the center of our lives in everything we do, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night, guys. Good night, everybody. Get to bed. Night, Go to everyone. work tomorrow. Good night, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.